Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, good morning. Or uh, good afternoon. It is past noon. So I'm not completely clueless on the subject, actually. I, I learned a bit recently. Uh, the The gist is that, right, it... You'll correct me if I'm wrong, or I'll learn in the video. So there are sanctions on Belarus, and so for doing something, and so Belarus is getting back at the EU by by offering really cheap planes to Belarus from Middle Eastern refugees that they push then to the Polish border to like get revenge because immigration is a very or migrant uh, migration is a very op uh, awkward topic in Europe right now. And so they're kind of using that as leverage. Um, yeah, anyways, uh, original link to the video, top of the description below. My name is Connor. I am from Rhode Island, best state in the Union. New England, the better England. And uh, USA in that order. Yeah, original link to the video, top of the description, right below that, link to the Discord. Let's go. Why Belarus is this video is made possible by team. Lower your If you aren't ready to learn, there's the door. Phones away. Phones away, even if you're watching on a phone. Monthly phone bill and get a free $25 credit by following the link that's down in the description. If you've been paying any attention to the international news recently, you may have noticed a lot of stuff going on in Belarus, a small post-Soviet landlocked country in Eastern Europe with just a tad more than 9 million people. While Belarus borders five countries, including Russia and Ukraine, it's their borders with the European Union, and particularly with Poland and Lithuania, that have been receiving the most press lately. Over the past couple of months, around 4,000 refugees from areas like Syria, Iraq, and Yemen have found themselves trapped on a narrow strip of land on the frontier between Belarus and Poland, causing both a humanitarian catastrophe and a political nightmare for the European Union. Many of the few thousand refugees are migrants trying to cross from Belarus into Poland, and then into the broader European Union from there. But Poland's current government under the Law and Justice Party gained power back in 2015 on an expressly anti-immigration stance for both their own nation and the EU at large. In 2015 alone, more than 1.3 million refugees entered Europe requesting asylum. The the highest number on the continent seen since the Second World War, and in response, promising to halt them became one of the backbones to the Law and Justice Party's campaign message. I just gotta turn off the heat here. Sorry. But pulling to halt them became one of the backbones to the Law and Justice Party's campaign message. But Poland has mostly always been located far away on the periphery of the greater European migrant crisis. Historically, over the past decade, most migrants have entered the continent through Greece or Italy, and few of them ventured up towards Poland, with most preferring to travel to wealthier and more welcoming states like Germany, France, the UK, or Sweden. For the sake of comparison, less than 300 Syrians had applied for refugee status in Poland per year before 2021, while next door Germany is home to nearly 600,000 refugees from Syria. So Poland has pretty much always been capable of keeping their more hardline stance of avoiding taking in refugees, without the rest of the world really caring or even noticing until right now on their border with Belarus. And all Guys, uh, you know, keep it civil in the comments, but at the same time, don't hold back in that. I, I, I want serious, uh, I want to know your guys' um, opinions on this the greater migrant crisis and what's happening in Belarus. Um, I, I don't want to be able to not tackle these sort of subjects that are fascinating to a lot of people. And so I, I'd love to hear your opinions. All of it is because of a single man, Alexander Lukashenko. Lukashenko is the current leader and disputed president of Belarus, who's one of the most fascinatingly bizarre leaders of the 21st century. He has ruled Belarus with an iron fist for more than 25 years now. He's often been described as Europe's final great dictator. Belarus has the lowest press freedoms in Europe and is the final European state that retains the death penalty and carries out executions. The Wikipedia page- Really? for human rights abuses in Belarus is literally dozens of pages long, with far too many controversies to mention here. But over all those nearly three decades of authoritarian rule, it was Lukashenko's poor response to the coronavirus pandemic that earned him the most recent scorn. He initially claimed that the virus didn't even exist, and refused to enact any measures within Belarus for public safety. On top of that, he even told Belarusian citizens to just drink vodka and visit the sauna twice a week to ward off the virus. 
More than 5,000 Belarusians have since died from COVID, while little more than a quarter of the population is presently fully vaccinated. And it should be noted that Lukashenko wasn't exactly very well beloved in Belarus drink vodka and visit the sauna twice a week to ward off the virus. More than 5,000 Belarusians vaccinated. And it should be noted that Lukashenko wasn't exactly very well beloved by all of the citizens of Belarus before this. Within his first year of office, he dissolved the Belarusian parliament and stacked it with his own loyal party members instead. His political opponents are often arrested and jailed or simply go missing. Criticism of him is illegal and has often been met both with torture and imprisonment. And for years, it was illegal to photograph him from the rear due to his embarrassment over his thinning hair and never a good look for a head of state. Lukashenko is also the wealthiest person in the country, with his own personal net worth estimated to be anywhere between 9 and 30 billion dollars. And on top of all of that, he is well known for his frequent homophobic, misogynistic, and anti-Semitic remarks. Needless to say, his popularity within the Does anyone know Putin's net worth? Because that's going to be huge. And I doubt it's as much. I bet it's more than he says it is. Country has been waning in recent years, which brings us up to the 2020 presidential election in Belarus. Lukashenko's poor response to the pandemic, along with the newest generation of young voters feeling frustrated by only ever having had a single president their entire lives, as well as a variety of other issues led to a push for very strong opposition. Lukashenko's primary electoral challenger arose in the form of this man, Sergei Tiganovsky. But shortly after announcing that he was running, he he was arrested and temporarily thrown into jail. Then, due to his incarceration, Tiganovsky could no longer fill out the proper paperwork to make his candidacy legal, which was likely the isn't that convenient. The entire point behind his arrest. Yeah, probably. So instead, his wife Svetlana Sikhanuskaya announced that she was running for president and filled out the paperwork for herself. She formed a coalition from several opposing parties and created a new unified popular front against the dictator's campaign. But then, when election day finally came around, polling stations across the country were dramatically reduced in number, including stations in Belarusian embassies across the world. The official stated reason from the government was due to public safety concerns over the coronavirus pandemic. But, understandably, most people called foul on that one owing to Lukashenko's prior actions during the pandemic. And then, before the polls had even closed, the government had announced that Lukashenko had won with 70% of the vote, which was suspiciously high, especially considering that the polls were still open. The night of the election, Tsiganouskaya filled a complaint with Belarus's Central Election Committee and was then promptly detained by Belarusian authorities for several hours. And by the following day, the government was claiming that Lukashenko Lukashenko had won with over 80% of the vote, a number that most critics believe to be virtually impossible. Due to the extensive improbability of this, numerous protests across the election erupted across the country. And while the Belarusian government has often quashed all dissent, the methods used in 2020 were particularly extreme. Water cannons, tear gas, rubber bullets, and even live ammunition from firearms were all used against the protesters that led to many injuries and several deaths. Live ammunition? Meanwhile, Siganuskaya fled across the border into Lithuania, fearing imprisonment or worse by her political opponent who was still in power. While Belarus received some international media coverage over the fraudulent election and the crackdown on protesters, it wasn't until a few months later when Lukashenko did something that the international community could no longer ignore. On the 21st of May, 2021... I have a question, question. So, Belarus has, has close ties with, with Russia, correct? So... Do you think that, like, are Putin and Lukashenko good chums, like good buds, and uh, Putin would kind of back up Lukashenko if, if he had to? A Ryanair passenger plane, flight 4978, had just left from Greece and was heading towards Lithuania on its regularly scheduled route that happened to cross over Belarus on the way. Just three minutes after entering into Belarusian airspace, the pilots of flight 4978 were contacted by Belarusian authorities and informed that there was a bomb threat on board the plane. They were instructed to immediately divert the flight to Minsk International Airport via escort by a Belarusian fighter jet. Once the plane landed, Belarusian authorities boarded the plane and arrested two passengers on board, Roman Petrosvech, a Belarusian citizen, and his girlfriend, Sofia Sapiega, a Russian citizen. No bomb was ever found and minimal evidence was ever shown to the public. Petrosvech is a Belarusian journalist well known for being highly critical of the Lukashenko regime, and after his arrest, was charged with, quote, mass unrest, while his girlfriend 
boyfriend was held for two months without any charges, until finally being accused of releasing personal information about Belarusian officials on the internet. As of December 2021, they are both still imprisoned by the Belarusian regime. To effectively authorize a state-sponsored hijacking of an international airline like this in order to kidnap a journalist and his girlfriend who were on board absolutely shocked the rest of the world, and was widely condemned by both the EU and NATO. The EU threatened sanctions that would ban all EU flights crossing over Belarus and ban all Belarusian airlines from entering any EU airspace, which drastically changed the flight paths of multiple airlines. The EU further demanded the release of the more than 500 political prisoners within the country, including Roman Petrosvich. And then, in response to all of that, Lukashenko said that if Belarus were to be sanctioned, he would, quote, flood the EU with migrants and drugs. Undeterred, the EU went ahead and imposed the sanctions anyway. Meanwhile, 5,000 miles away at the Olympic Games in Tokyo, Kristina Simonovskaya, a Belarusian Olympic sprinter, recorded an Instagram story criticizing her coaching team. Then, while at the airport waiting to return back to Belarus, Simonovskaya decided that it wouldn't be safe for her to return and was taken into protective custody, as criticizing Belarus from abroad is illegal and can be punished by multiple years in prison. Simonovskaya was- Jesus Christ. It's illegal to criticize your country from abroad. Offered asylum in most of the EU, but she settled on Belarus's next door neighbor, Poland, which brings us back to the current ongoing crisis. Following the sanctions from the European Union, Belarusian officials, along with state-owned travel and tourism companies, began encouraging large-scale tourism to Belarus from the Middle East. Hundreds of flights were suddenly added from Damascus, Beirut, Baghdad, Istanbul, and more were suddenly added by Belarusian airlines directly to Minsk, while prices for many of the flights were drastically reduced. Belarusian visas were given to pretty much anyone who flew there, while Belarusian authorities flooded social media with false information about the legality and ease of crossing the border into the EU. You via Poland. Upon arrest, I can't believe this worked out so well. So we pretty much made it dirt cheap to be able to fly to Minsk and promise, you know, and and them knowing that it's it's much more defended in the countries surrounding the EU that it'd be easier to cross into Poland. Arrival, these people were given instructions on how to get to the Polish, Lithuanian, and Latvian borders, and were sometimes even transported directly there by truck and given wire cutters and axes to get through any fences. And if you look at the map, it's easy to see why people trying to get out of a terrible situation in the Middle East and into the European Union might think that Belarus is the best way to go. While not in the EU itself, Belarus has borders with Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, all three of which are EU states and Poland, particularly particularly borders Germany. And for many of those currently stuck in Belarus, their final goal is to get to Germany, the country with one of the most friendly and open refugee and asylum policies in the world. However, the problem is that as easy as it is to enter Belarus, once they actually get to the Polish border, they're totally left on their own. Poland has continued their hardline stance of not letting anyone inside, and they've amassed thousands of troops on the border to push anyone who crosses back into Belarus. In addition, Poland, Lithuania... So they're stuck. Stuck. Rock in a hard place. Classic. So they're between a EU country with a... who they elected a leader who in 2015 who was very much elected on the basis of keeping um migrants out and then you have a country belarus who who clearly doesn't care about the migrants at all the well-being of the migrants they're just being used as tools uh, as pawns and, and so now these these poor people are, are kind of stuck between two countries that kind of don't want them thousands of troops on the border to push anyone who crosses back into Belarus. In addition, Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia have all recently agreed to build a border fence across their entire mutual shared border with Belarus. So a wall to keep this from happening again. At the same time, Belarusian border troops are preventing migrants from heading back away from the border and back into Belarus, and have refused all requests from Polish and international humanitarian aid workers that would have given the migrants tents and sleeping bags, among other supplies. And then, from the reports of abuse by Belarusian border guards, to reports of families being split up... Uh, you can't really... It'd be hard to blame... Is this controversial? It, it, it's terrible. Like, look at this little kid here. Um... You know what they have to go through maybe like take the little kids and maybe the women but i 
you can't just place you can't get very I can't get angry at Poland for not letting them in. I mean, what are you supposed to do? Just just let Belarus keep trucking migrants over and over and over and putting them on your border and just saying, okay, come on right in. Here you go. So that's a delicate situation. By Polish Border Patrol to hundreds of injuries and multiple fatalities, things continue seeming like they're getting worse. Without any context, it might all seem understandable to think of all of this as just a few bad policies bumping heads with one another. But with the larger context, it's clear that Lukashenko's Belarus is encouraging thousands of migrants and refugees. Two bad policies bumping heads with one another. I don't know how you can really say the Polish policy is, is bad, right? I mean, you can definitely say the Belarusian. In larger context, it's clear that Lukashenko's Belarus is let encouraging if, thousands if of migrants and refugees to travel to Belarus on the false promises see, like, of look, look at that little girl. That, that's when it gets really sad. Like, it's one to see all these men kind of, you know, dealing with the cold and whatnot, but uh, that's really sad. ...of migrants and refugees to travel to Belarus on the false promises of them finding safety in the European Union, only to then traffic and dump them at the border, thereby manufacturing an incredible humanitarian crisis, and all in response to sanctions imposed against him for his own authoritarian rule. While Belarus has since reduced the number of flights coming into Minsk from the Middle East, and has allowed some migrants out from the border zone to fly back to their home country, thousands are still left in danger on the border. And with Lukashenko showing no sign of ever giving up his own power, there's currently no end in sight for the crisis. But there probably is an end in sight to how much you're probably overpaying for your current cell phone plan, and Ting is here to help. Listen, it was a great video, guys. I I'm going to make sure if he has any promo codes to um get them out. I know a lot of you are going to. So make sure enough for an if you're going to use this Ting, you know, link in the description. Make sure to use that link right here. RLL real life lore it'll it'll help them th th so that the advertiser knows that they came from real life lore and will end up paying them more so I always want to do that when I'm reacting to their videos um but yeah uh, uh, uh also a good video a uh, very interesting and complex yeah um going to do a history hit video I'll I'll watch a few more videos on this if you guys would like see you next time